Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Let's start our video with a story about a dedicated service worker navigating the challenges of an unyielding schedule, a humiliating incident, and ultimately standing up for their dignity in the workplace. I quit a job in the pettiest way possible. So I worked in the service industry for a decent amount of time and in a few different cities. I landed a job in one of these new cities at a restaurant that has a few locations across the state and is moving to expand to a couple other states. When I applied, I specifically stated I would prefer to work mornings, a night or two a week would be fine if necessary, but prior to getting this job, I'd been physically assaulted when leaving work at around 1 a.m. I didn't give the full story during the interview, but I did make it clear that I was looking for a schedule that didn't involve late nights, and the manager I interviewed with said that was completely doable. I got a call a day later saying I'd gotten the job, I was bartending, and went through training and everything seemed fine. The place was open from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. every day, the busiest times were for brunch every day, and then the late night bar crowd. My first schedule out of training was all closing bar shifts. I was a bit put off because of the scheduled conversation during the interview, but I went with it and gave them the benefit of the doubt, especially knowing when you're bringing in six new hires, it can be hard getting everyone's schedule straight. More time went on and I was still working mostly nights, maybe one morning shift sprinkled in every so often. I brought it to the hiring manager's attention and he said they would try to get me more morning shifts. I went along with it for a while without seeing any change. Eventually, I brought it to the GM's attention and let him know that when I was hired, I was given the impression that I would be a daytime bartender and I'd been stuck working shifts where leaving at 3 a.m. was getting out of there quickly. He gave me a little bit of attitude and told me that all employees were required to work any shifts assigned to them. Obviously, I knew that, but it was incredibly irritating that I was told one thing before I actually accepted the job, and now I'm working the opposite schedule. The GM was an unbearable human, incredibly sexist, thought he was always the smartest and best-looking person in the room and so on. He was constantly belittling the employees in the guise of training. Fast forward to a couple of weeks after my conversation with him, I'd finally been scheduled a brunch shift on a Saturday morning. This place didn't take reservations and people are lining up outside of the door at 7.30 in the morning. I was bartending with two other people behind a pretty small bar. It maybe sat 15 people, but in a circle. So not a lot of room for three people to be back there. We open and it's incredibly busy, but everything's running smoothly. A couple hours into the shift, one of the hoses from the dish machine gets loose and just starts spraying water all over that side of the bar. I, of course, was the one on that side and it completely drenched me before we could grab the hose and shut the dish machine off. My face and hair were soaking, but the real humiliation came from the fact that the uniform shirt I was wearing that morning was white. I immediately headed to the bathroom to dry my face and one of the servers followed me to make sure I was okay. You could obviously see everything through the shirt, and after I had composed myself, I went to the GM to get a new shirt and get back to work. He told me he didn't have the time to get the keys and go through the bins to get one. I was shocked. It took me a minute, but I got back behind the bar and was incredibly upset and knew that this would be my last shift. I worked for about another 30 minutes. I took orders from bar guests and pulled as many service well tickets as I could. We were in the heat of service at that point, and every spot in the restaurant was full. Every service well ticket I pulled, I crumpled up in my hand, and every order I took, I never rang in. After that half hour, I excused myself to the bathroom, grabbed my things, and left. I knew that everyone who complained about things taking too long would have their food or drinks comped. A part of me felt a little bit guilty for doing what I did only for the guest's sake, the larger part of me felt good because that disrespectful a-hole was going to have to apologize to everyone and let them know they would be taken care of. I've never been humiliated in that way at any place I've ever worked for. Looking back on it, I have no regrets. To the people that put up with management or owner's bullcrap, don't do it. Find a place where you're treated with respect. They do exist. The GM was fired a few months later for stealing. Well played. I'm amazed that you hung around as long as you did. I'm hoping they had to comp a lot of things to make customers happy. And our second story. Dress Donation Dilemma. 
I was selling four cocktail slash ball gown dresses online. One gold, one blue, one green, and the last one was a navy dress made for a child. They were all originally around $200 to $300. I was selling them for around $20 to $50 each. I received a call from a lovely sounding lady who initially asked about the gold dress, the most expensive. Then she realized I was selling more than one dress and her questions quickly turned from what size is it to personal questions such as why are you selling them? Where did you wear them? And oh, but I'm sure you look beautiful in them. Are you sure you want to sell them? Slightly confused, I answered the questions. They were essentially just taking up space in my rather small wardrobe. Oh, but surely they mean something to you, dresses or memories. I suppose. I have my photos of the events, though, so I'm happy to let them go. Well, if that's the case, perhaps you would consider giving them to me. You can donate them. I run a wonderful charity for women who need dresses but can't afford them. They would love your dresses. You'd be helping other women have wonderful memories of their own. I'd honestly considered this before. During formal season, Australian version of prom, there are various charities that do collect and give away dresses and suits for struggling families so their kids can dress up and enjoy their formals. So I asked her which charity she belonged to. We're new. We're just getting started. We just love your dresses. They'd really help us get started. Oh, okay. Do you have a website or Facebook I can look at? Are you a registered charity? Oh, no, no, no. We don't have any of that yet. Okay, so you're like, well-known charity name? Not yet. She starts to speak quickly here as if trying to avoid me noticing. We set up stores for families to come to and sell the dresses much cheaper than any other stores. But we're a charity. Sorry, you sell them? Yes, but we're a charity. If you send us the dresses, we can make sure they go to people who need them. We're based in another state. I know postage isn't expensive. You'd really be doing a wonderful thing for us and families in need. I'm sorry, but um, how much do you normally charge for the dresses? Suddenly, she sounds a little less bubbly and cheerful and a little more on the snarky side, speaking faster than she already had been. Oh, that doesn't matter. You don't need them, right? What's $100 to you against helping to make a lovely memory for a lovely lady in need? I'm happy to donate them to a charity, but I'm not sure I'm comfortable with posting them. I think I'd rather deliver them to a local charity. Now all of the cheerfulness is out of her voice. She's almost snappy now. Well, that would be your choice. Personally, I believe in helping those who ask. If you had no intention of giving them away, you should have said so. I'll take all four for $50 if that makes you happy. But I don't think you should want money at all. I think you should just do the right thing and donate them. I'm a little stunned at the sudden turn in behavior. You have a great point. I'll donate them to my local charity. Thanks for the idea and have a lovely day. She started to say something else, but I hung up at that point. I'm not sure she understands what charity means, but my definition certainly isn't buying cheap dresses to sell for more. This seriously reminds me of those uh, boxes or containers they put around to donate clothes for charities when it's really more like organizations sell them, make money, and maybe donate 1% to this or that charity. Glad you didn't fall for her BS. And our next story. But we're a charity. So I had a bit of a wild situation with my neighbor recently that really got under my skin. I've been living on this street for about a year, and parking's all street parking. No one has a designated spot. But apparently, my neighbor decided she was entitled to a specific spot in front of her house. One day, I parked there, not thinking much of it, and went about my business. Next thing I know, I have the police knocking on my door. They tell me they received a phone call about an abandoned vehicle, and it turns out they were talking about my car. The cosmetic damage from an accident a few months back must have made it look a bit rough, but it was far from abandoned. The police claimed they were concerned I might have wandered off injured, so they broke into my car, found some mail with my address, just a few houses up the street, and came to inform me. Now my car's locks are damaged from their forced entry, and it won't lock properly. This not only affects its resale value, but also makes it easier to break into. I was parked legally and had done nothing wrong, but my property is now damaged due to my neighbor's pettiness and the police overreaction. I documented the damage to my car thoroughly with photos and a written description. Then I contacted the police department to explain the situation and express my frustration. I requested a written report of the incident, which would detail the officer's actions and the reasons behind them. 
With this report in hand, I filed a formal complaint with the police department outlining the unnecessary damage to my vehicle and requesting compensation for the repairs. I also reached out to my insurance company to see if they would cover the damage, explaining that it was caused by police actions. Next, I consulted with a lawyer. They advised me to send a demand letter to the police department requesting compensation for the cost of the repairs and any other related expenses. The letter included estimates from a reputable auto repair shop to fix the locks and any other damages. The police department agreed to cover the cost of the repairs, my car was fixed, and I didn't have to pay out of pocket for the damage caused by the officer's actions. As for my neighbor, I decided to have a calm conversation with her and explain the trouble and damage her call caused. She seemed taken aback by the consequences and apologized. While it didn't undo the damage, at least it brought some awareness to her actions. And our last story. Insane Karen breaks into my house, calls 911 on me. So I'm sitting at home in the evening watching TV when suddenly there's a loud knock at the door. I thought someone had the wrong address, but the knocking continued so forcefully that I had to go and open it. On the doorstep stood a middle-aged woman with an expression on her face like she was about to eat someone alive. I hadn't even managed to say anything when she literally pushed her way in, threw her jacket on my couch, and declared, Michael is waiting for me. You must be his friend. I was, to put it mildly, shocked. What the hell, I asked. She snorted and said, Bring me a soda or Michael will give you a beating. At that point, I couldn't hold back anymore. There's no Michael here, I replied. Don't lie and bring me a soda, she continued. I grabbed my Glock 23 and said, I'm counting to 10. Karen bolted like a bullet. Half an hour later, she called 911 on me. Officers knocked on the door and said I was under arrest. They had their hands on their holsters when Karen ran up and slapped me in the face. The officers didn't notice this and said, Please step to the car, sir. I went and told them that I was the homeowner and seeing Karen for the first time. I could show them the documents. Karen started screaming that I was a liar. The officer asked if I could provide the documents right then. Accompanied by the officer, I went into the house and showed the documents. At that moment, neighbors approached and confirmed that I was the homeowner, and they've never seen Karen before. The officer pondered, unfastened the handcuffs, and said that Karen had been screaming very emotionally and begging for help. I explained that she'd broken into my house, refused to leave, and after I threw her out, everything else happened. The officer questioned the neighbors, and they confirmed my words. Karen visibly became nervous. The officer asked if I wanted to press charges. I said yes. Karen was charged with trespassing, making a false police call, and assaulting me. As she was being arrested, the officer said that, according to state laws, if I'd shot her, they would have had much less work. You can't break into someone else's house. I still don't know if I agree with the officer. If the circumstances had been different, Karen could have caused me a lot more trouble. I hope a stay in jail helps her a bit. Officer, arrest him! Karen, who says such things, doesn't realize she can ruin a person's fate for life. Or if she does, then it's much worse. In my youth, I never heard of anything like that. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.